Do you know what the advanced premium tax credit is and how it works? Well, here to talk with me about that is Dana Onspot from Sensible Money. Dana, welcome. Hi, Bob. Great to be here. Great to have you here because this is a complicated topic and we're eager to have you walk us through what it is and who does it apply to. <laughs> well, it is a complicated topic. So it, it also goes by different names. So you'll hear it called the premium tax credit, the health care tax credit. So what exactly is it? Well, it is something designed to make health care more affordable. And we are talking today specifically about how it may apply to retirees. So there are different phases of health care in retirement. And that first phase would be somebody pre-age 65. So they retired maybe at 55, 58, it could be 62. And there could be different ways that they could access health care at that point. They may have a COBRA policy available if they worked with an employer that had over 20 employees. They may have some form of retiree health care, but they also most certainly have access to a plan off healthcare.gov or in some states like California, it's called Covered California. And so this plan uh, comes with the potential to qualify for subsidies or tax credits. And after you've decided which plan is more beneficial, whether it be a healthcare.gov plan or your COBRA or a retiree health plan, um, part of that decision actually should be, will I qualify for healthcare tax credits? And this is where we see people think or maybe assume that, oh, well, you know, I make too much money. There's no way I would, I would qualify. And so they may not be factoring all of the, you know, the potential savings into their analysis. Right. So in terms of how much someone might pay for health insurance if they retire before 65, before they go on Medicare, any thoughts about what people can expect to pay? Well, I, I could simplify it and say a lot, <laughs> but the reality is, so there was an article in Forbes um, this May, May of 2023, that really outlined what they called the average cost. And so a single adult age 50 might expect to pay about five to 600 a month, a single adult age 60, closer to a thousand a month. So if you're looking at now a couple age 50, you're talking 1300 to 1400 a month. And if you're looking at a couple couple age 60, you're talking about close to 2000 a month or maybe 24000 a year. Now, if we take that couple age 60 and they get closer and closer, 63, 64, we could be talking about 30000 per year, but that's without subsidies. So that's assuming that they, they don't qualify for, for any subsidies. So then you have to take a look at, well, how would I qualify? You know, how do the actual tax credits work? And there is a complex formula that determines, you know, what would you qualify for? It starts by calculating your benchmark premium. And so this benchmark premium is based on, I believe, the second lowest cost silver plan. So when you go to health there, healthcare.gov, there's different plans. There's bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. Those plans are based on the co-share between you and the insurance company, how much, what portion each of you will pay. And so they, they take your benchmark plan based on your location, and then it, it runs through this formula. Now, that formula has changed in the last few years. So before 2021, it was simply, you looked at what are called the federal poverty guidelines. And there is a great website called healthreformbeyondthebasics.org that explains this formula and has a set of tables. And so you can look up your household size, and you can look up the, the percentage above poverty level that you are at, and it will calculate out, you know, I'll give you an example. For a household of two, let's say we have a retired couple, the 400% poverty level is uh, cut off is about 78,800. 
maybe I have a rounding error in there because I'm going from memory. So if you made more than that, you would not qualify for a tax credit under the old rules. But in 2021, they changed that. And they it, it, that started with the American Rescue Plan, and then the Inflation Reduction Act extended that change through 2025. So as of right now, retirees have this opportunity between now and 2025 where their expected contribution toward health care costs is going to be capped at about 8.5% of their adjusted gross income. Now, I can go into more detail if you'd like, but that's a, that's a high-level overview of, of, of how those tax credits work. Well, we could go into greater detail if you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me try to, try to kind of summarize it. So first, where we see a lot of people have hangups is with this concept of adjusted gross income. And so that actually is line 11, if you were to look at your 2022 tax return. And there's all different types of adjusted gross income in the tax code. For healthcare tax credits, they use your adjusted gross income. Then if you owned any tax-free bonds, you would have to add back any tax-exempt income. And then you would have to add back any non-taxable Social Security. So, for example, if you were 62 and it claimed Social Security, a portion of your Social Security is taxable, a portion is not. So you would have to add back the non-taxable Social Security. And then you would have to add back any untaxed foreign income. So you would start with your adjusted gross income, line 11, and then you would have to add back these items. That would determine the income that you would compare against those poverty level tables. Then on that same website, Health Reform Beyond the Basics, you would scroll down to table two. And table two would show you what your expected premium contribution was. So I'm going to use an example with round numbers. Let's say your adjusted gross income after running it through that formula is 100000 And you were at the 400% uh, above poverty level your expected premium contribution is 8.5%. You can pull that off the table. And so what would happen is they would say, okay, your maximum contribution is 8,500, 8.5% of 100,000. Now, let's assume we have a 60-year-old couple and the second lowest cost silver plan was, for the two of them, was going to be 23,844 a year. So that was their benchmark. They are expected to pay 8,500. So the difference between that 23,844 and the 8,500 would be the credit. So the credit would be 15,344 or about 1,278 per month. Now you would have the option to apply that 1,278 directly to your premium. So each month you're only paying 709. Then at the end of the year, you file a tax form where there's a reconciliation that happens. So just like you do with your income taxes, you either get a refund or you owe a little bit more. So at the end of the year, if they advanced you too much of a credit, let's say your income was even higher or your benchmark premium, you calculated it wrong or something happened where they, they, they advanced you too much, then you would owe the difference back. At the end of the year, however, if they did not advance you enough of a premium, you would get that as a refund. And so it would be a direct credit against taxes owed. Not a deduction, not as a percentage, but, but a direct credit. Is that all clear as day now? It's very clear, actually. And uh, now I'm eager to learn uh, how someone can maybe improve their chances of being eligible for the credit. So there's a few ways. When you think of taxable income or your adjusted gross income in this case, that is not the same as cash flow. 
So let's say I retired and I had $100,000 in a savings account and I take a withdrawal from that savings account to cover my living expenses. Well, that withdrawal, if I even if I used all 100000 that's not taxable income. That doesn't show up in my adjusted gross income formula. Only the interest I earned on that savings does. And so if you can plan where your cash flow is going to come from, there may be ways to structure it so that your adjusted gross income stays lower underneath certain threshold amounts and allows you to qualify for a greater credit. Some options could be using a loan against a cash value life insurance policy. That would not be taxable income. You could possibly use a home equity line of credit to cover your living expenses. And then once you reached age 65, you'd pull money out to pay that loan back. It could be CDs or bonds that are maturing. So when a bond matures, that maturity amount isn't taxable income, assuming it's not inside of a retirement account. It could be the example I used, a withdrawal from savings. It could be withdrawals from Roth IRAs, although that's not my preferred source. You really want to let those Roths grow from later. But it could be that you're using your HSAs to cover uh, out-of-pocket medical expenses. So, so there's all kinds of ways that you may be able to plan your cash flow. Let's say you're retiring at 60, and you could have this five-year plan to cover your cash flow from sources that would keep that adjusted gross income low and allow you to qualify for a greater credit. So, Dana, that's how you can improve your chances of becoming eligible for the credit, but there are some things that you can do to make you either ineligible or reduce the amount of the credit? There are. So, as you know, I'm a big fan of Roth conversions, and we call that time period, if you were to retire early, up until about where required minimum distributions start, the opportunity years, where you're often in a lower tax rate and you have the opportunity to do Roth conversions. However, if you would qualify for one of the premium health care tax credits, that might be a reason to not do the Roth conversions. So if you're doing Roth conversions, that could disqualify you for the health care tax credit. And by our calculations, the tax credits are more valuable. So they're truly a dollar for dollar credit money that you don't have to pay versus paying the tax and then growing it later tax-free. And so we've run scenarios out both ways. We do think that the health care tax, tax credits are, are worth more. The other things you have to watch out for would be realizing a large amount of capital gains. If you were selling a concentrated stock position, um, if you were cashing in something like I-bonds that you've owned for a long time, those have deferred taxation in them. Uh, if you had a lump sum distribution from a pension plan that you are taking a, as a taxable distribution, not as a rollover. So you just have to watch out for anything that could have a big tax consequence. If you own private investments or real estate investments, uh, you may not have as much control over that. So, so they can have tax consequences or you know decide that they're going to disperse uh, something and that's on their timeline, not on yours. But for anything you do have control over, you can plan that out and, and increase your odds of qualifying for, for the credit. Right. And it, and this is a credit that can be really valuable to many people. And, right. I have seen people that had credits of 20. In one case, um, it was close to $30,000 a year of credit that was applied toward their, their premium. Now, Something to be aware of, although there's a benchmark plan that is simply used in the formula to determine the amount of credit you qualify for, that's not the plan you have to choose. So you can choose any of the plans, and there are HSA-eligible plans. And so you could choose a plan that still allowed you to make deductible HSA contributions, which that can help bring your income down. And if you had part-time work, uh, perhaps a you know more of a fun type of job, let's say you worked at a golf pro shop or, um, you know, as a ski instructor, you know, on occasion, I've had clients do both. You could contribute to a deductible IRA, uh, you know, and, and try to reduce or offset that small amount of part-time income to, to keep your adjusted gross income down. So even though you, you know, might still have some income, there are still ways that you may be able to qualify for this credit. 
So we talked about using the advanced premium tax credit if you have a plan through the marketplace or if you have a high deductible health plan and you're contributing to an HSA. What about if you're on COBRA? You know, if you're on COBRA, unfortunately, you can't use the, the premium tax credit. So it's specifically paired up with plans that come from what is called the exchange or the marketplace. You can look up your state on healthcare.gov to see specifically what plans are available in your state. But unfortunately, you can't use it against COBRA. And so that becomes part of that analysis. So you'll have access to COBRA typically for 18 months. So let's say you were leaving at 62. Um, you can look at your COBRA costs. Now, my understanding is that those premiums are based on the average age of the workforce. So if you worked for an employer that had over 20 employees, but had a, you know a much younger workforce, it's possible that those COBRA premiums could be lower than even your subsidized premium on a marketplace plan. So you do want to do that analysis, but the, the actual health care tax credits are only um, paired up with a, an exchange plan. Yeah, and we've talked about it mostly in the case of people who are retired pre-Medicare, um, but there are also people who might be working for employers who don't provide uh, health insurance, employer-sponsored health insurance. Those two, are, those people are also able to use the tax, in some cases, the premium tax credit. They are, absolutely. And so that could be a case, again, when we talked about, you know, maybe your employer uh, doesn't provide health care, you work for a smaller employer, but you might still be able to fund IRAs to bring your adjusted gross income down or, you know, contribute to a 401k if your employer offers that, and that helps bring your adjusted gross income down. So there might still be ways to keep your income lower and, and qualify for a higher credit. All right. Do you want to talk about some tips and traps by chance? I think some of the mistakes or traps people fall into is not knowing when they go to the marketplace and it and there's various calculators that you can plug in to see should, you know, might you qualify for a credit. They don't know what to use for income. And so looking at your adjusted gross income from last year may or may not be applicable to the current tax year. And so we've seen people who qualify or think they qualify for the tax credit. And then at the end of the year, they end up owing all that money back. And if you didn't set aside the cash, that could be a big surprise. So that's definitely something to, to watch out for is that you would owe that money back. Um, if your income changes, so maybe partway through the year, something happens. I mean, it could be an inheritance. It could be a distribution from a former employer that was taxable income that you weren't expecting. And you realize that your income is going to be much higher than what you had plugged into that calculator to, to determine your credit. So you would want to go online and, and report that. And that could change it mid-year. Or you wouldn't have to. You could wait and at the end of the year, you know, file the tax form and, and just be prepared to owe extra money then. Um, and really, you know, not filing. There's a, a very specific tax form that needs to be filed. It's called Form 8962. And so that has to get filed. So if you're doing your own tax return or if you forget to tell your um, tax preparer that, hey, I took an advanced premium tax credit, those would be important things, whether you're doing your own or whether you're there, someone is doing it for you, to make sure that you're filing the proper form and that reconciliation is happening each year. Right. Um, there's one tip um, I've read that uh, where people are told maybe to take less than the full amount of their tax credit so that in case their income is higher than they anticipated or predicted, that at least maybe they don't have to owe as much. Any thoughts about that as a tactic? I think that can work just fine. If you're the kind of person that, for example, likes to get a refund at the end of the year, you know, the financial planner in me, especially now that we can earn 5% in short-term CDs or in a money market fund, the financial planner in me says, well, why wouldn't you want to have that money throughout the year and earn interest on it? But I understand that some people that's not their nature. It doesn't feel good. They'd rather get that refund. And so if that's the case, I, I think that strategy is, is fine. Yeah. And, and the last thing, I've not read about it or seen it happen firsthand, but scammers may be pretending to be from the IRS and ask you about your APTC. 
Oh, scammers are going to pretend to be anyone and everyone you can think of. And so absolutely, no one from the IRS would call you. Um, you know, no one from healthcare.gov would, would call you and ask for your personal information. So you always want to go to, you know, the authoritative, the definitive websites. You want to go directly for your messages. Uh, you don't want to give out this personal information to someone unverified over the phone. Those are, are things we have to be careful of across the board mm, yeah so we covered a lot of ground anything we missed or anything that just bears re-emphasizing you know the the main thing that would bear re-emphasizing is that proper planning can help you take advantage of some of these credits that are available of course not for everyone uh let's say you had a, a large pension that you started at 55 or at 60 you know that income may mean that you're going to qualify for not as much of a credit but with the way it's structured right now your expected premium contribution is eight and a half percent of your adjusted gross income and that means a lot more people could qualify than maybe think hmm well, Dana, as always, it's a great pleasure having you share your knowledge and wisdom with us. And I think this is going to help a good many people, especially those who are unaware of this credit and, and how much it can help them. I absolutely hope so.